Good evening to the saints of God. Welcome to the Church of Christ that meets on Miami Garden to Drive, our midweek Bible study. On behalf of the eldership, Brother Lindsey Baker Jr., Brother Richard Nelson IV, and myself, our deacons, Brother Lennon Ferreras, Brother David James, Brother Ellis Dowdell. Uh, we welcome you and all the saints in Miami Gardens. We welcome you tonight uh, to a continued conversation as it relates to biblical study. And tonight we just ask a simple question. Should we love the world? Should we love the world? We have a lesson text we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, but one of the things we want to talk about tonight, saints, and before we uh, get into uh, the lesson, uh, we encourage you to ask your questions, make your comments at the end. Uh, we'll certainly uh, address that at the appropriate time. Additionally, uh, we know that starting tonight, a password is required. I know the engineers are getting texts literally as we speak. Uh, and I think our attendance will increase over time. I knew this would happen, Brother Rick, uh, Brother Lindsay. Uh, the password is all caps M-G-C-C, M-G-C-C, uh, all right? So if you're here, you already know that because it probably asked you for a password coming in, uh, but please keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, at this time, uh, let us uh, go to God in prayer, and then we'll get into our lesson tonight. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for yet another day. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We pray, dear God, that as we assemble tonight, as we study your word, <clears throat> that it'll be taught in such a way that all can understand and apply and do your will and have a deeper perspective on what this life is all about, recognizing that your word has clearly manifested truth, that we ought to live, we ought to obey, and do what is necessary to inherit eternal life. Be with all that are here, be with those that are yet on their way. We pray that everyone will continue to be wise as we deal with the global pandemic. But God, you already know. God, you already see the end. Uh, and because you are there in the beginning and you'll be with us through eternity. We trust you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, saints, uh, let's, let's go to work here. Uh, and we want to, I'll do a couple things tonight. Uh, and as it relates to uh, the word of God, uh, we want to really just look at what's already biblically resolved. Brother Rick has dealt with this. I've addressed it as well. Uh, and the Bible clearly has outlined a few basic things. And if you've been with us throughout uh, these lessons on Sundays and Wednesdays, they are running concurrent and they certainly uh, strengthen one another. Uh, and thank God for my brother, my brother Richard Nelson IV, uh, and the ability uh, and the opportunity we have to teach God's word. Heaven and hell are real. We've been touching, talking about a place of eternal rest, a place of eternal torment. Luke chapter 16, we won't go over there, but the rich man and Lazarus, we talked about that a few weeks back as it relates to how we live physically, uh, certainly has a bearing, an eternal bearing on where we spend eternity uh, as well. And once we die, we have to clearly understand that that place of torment, that place of rest, uh, as in the Hadean world, uh, hell, uh, certainly uh, as we prepare for judgment, is, is, it's real. Revelation 14 and verse 13, a scripture we oftentimes use at the end, I want to use that at the beginning. And since we haven't gone there for a little while, let's go to Revelation 14 and 13. We recognize in Luke 16, rich man and Lazarus, two different ways of living physically, two, di two distinct places post-death. That word post, I'm not talking about a social media post. Post means after. Two distinct places post or after death. There is life after death. Uh, Revelation 14 and verse 13, I'll find last book and a collection of books, the Biblios, the Bible. Revelation 14 and 13, the Bible says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, uh, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the spirit, that they, those who die in the Lord may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So heaven and hell are real, rest and torment eternally are real. It's resolved. This is not open, this is not up for biblical dispute because the Bible is clear. We are born physically, we must be born again. Now Jesus says, and turn your Bibles over to John, you're gonna get some uh, exercise tonight because I want you looking at these scriptures and putting them in your long-term notes. In John 3, in the verse 6, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, that which is born of the flesh, uh, John chapter 3 and verse number 6, uh, that which is born of the flesh 
and that which is born of the Spirit. Go back to verse 5. I should have put 5 and 6 there. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we have to be born again. So we know there's heaven and hell. There's reality after death. There's life after death. We know we must be born. We are born physically. We're alive. But we must be born again. We all have an appointment with death. And in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, followed by judgment. Judgment by definition means to make it right. God has to make it right. God cannot allow sin to dwell eternally with him. And so in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, just quoting for time's sake, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, uh, the judgment. So we recognize the fact that after we die, we must be judged based on how we lived. And so, it is, so it's biblically resolved that we have an appointment with death after which we must face the judgment. A second death, not a second physical death, Second death relates to the spiritual realm. Death means separation. A second death is not what we want, that lake of fire, that Gehenna, as we've been discussing. Revelation 20 and verse 14. Come on, let's go over there. Revelation chapter 20 and beginning at verse 14. I'm really locking in on verse 14. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. Make sure you have your Bibles class. Revelation 20 and verse 14. <clears throat> Here the Bible states, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So death and hell were cast, the Hadean world uh, were cast into the lake of fire. So if you're in a place of torment in the Hadean world, uh, you are then literally cast into Gehenna, the lake of fire, uh, the second death. Let's go to Revelation 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21 and verse 8. Now, who will be in this Gehenna? Does the Bible tell us? It's biblically resolved. Revelation 21 and 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, translated detestable, and murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers, idolat and, idol and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire, the lake of fire, that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is, which is the second death. So the Bible, it is biblically resolved that the second death is not what we want. So stop lying, stop whoremongering. Uh, again, this Miss Cleo foolishness, I don't know if you all know who Miss Cleo is, but this palm reading and sorcery and all of that, uh, quit tr you're trying to read somebody's palms, put the Bible in your palm or your hands and read that because all of that will have its place in the lake of fire. It is resolved. And as we, as we continue, so tonight, the reason we kind of walk back or review what's biblically resolved from the previous lessons is to help us recognize the necessity of a lesson like we have tonight. We must live with a focus on eternity. If we know that there's a place reserved for eternal rest and a place reserved for eternal torment, then what manner of persons ought we to be? How do we live our lives? And we must live with a focus on eternity. Hebrews chapter 12, in the verses two, and I often use the example, uh, Rick and I, and we didn't do that this year, Rick, we gotta give him a call, hopefully he's doing okay. Rick and I call our track coach typically every Father's Day, because he was a father figure to us. You know, our parents were divorced when we were young. Uh, and <clears throat> Coach Ron Sleever, Toledo, Ohio, Bowser High School, and when, when he would train us on how to run a race, he said, don't you, look, don't you look left, don't you look right, you look straight ahead. And I think about that often, Brother Rick, as we look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number two. And I hope you turn your Bibles over there, uh, get used to turning those pages in your Bible, Hebrews 12 and two, when we think about this race, this, this human race, this life we call, uh, what we call life, if you will, this race we call life, look at how, where should we look? Hebrews 12 and 2 states, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set, which for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus looked for the joy set before him, not to the left or to the right. We should look to Jesus 
not to the left or to the right, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So tonight, I want to talk about, for the next few minutes, should we love the world? That's the question. The Bible's going to clearly answer it. And if you've already looked at the lesson text, it answers it very clearly. But let's just take a look at the putting the world, and we're going to, we're going to use that word, world. We're going to translate it, put it in the proper context. Because oftentimes you can say, you know, the world, and you can be totally uh, speaking in one context, you can say the world, and it's something you should avoid. So let's take a look at it. So we're going to put the world in perspective tonight so we can live accordingly. Because if we don't put the world in the proper perspective, we may miss out on heaven. So let's go to work. What the world is not. What the world is not. And as we think about this tonight, uh, class, uh, we'll go to lesson text in a minute. But I want to make sure we understand. When we say the world. We're not talking about the physical earth. Uh, Genesis chapter one and verse number one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So when we say the world in, the, in this biblical context, we're not talking about the earth. Go to Genesis one and verse 31. Genesis chapter one and verse 31. Genesis chapter one and verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God created the heavens and the earth. There's no mistake. It's not evolution. It's not some big bang theory. That's just man's foolishness. So when we talk about the world tonight and not loving the world, I want us to be clear that the world is not the, the earth. The world is not, you know, again, in, this con in the context of not loving the world, mankind the human world. In John chapter 3 and the verses 16, uh, many of us, you can probably quote that, but we will go to it just for the benefit of our visitors tonight to make sure that everybody sees what the Bible says. So I'll take my word for it. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pause for a minute. So the world is not the earth. The world we're speaking of tonight is not mankind because the Bible says God so loved the world. So that would be a biblical contradiction if we say, well, you know, don't love mankind. First John chapter four, beginning at verse nine. First John chapter four, beginning at verse number nine. In this was manifested. That word manifested means reveal. The word manifested means to make plain. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That word means the atonement, the payment, the ransom for our sins. And so let's just pause for a minute. The question on the floor is, should we love the world? What I failed to mention was what I have in the very top. Don't love the world. Turn your Bibles now to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. I'm going to back this up a little bit. So there we go. Go to 1 John 2 and verse 15. We're already in 1 John 4. Go back a couple chapters. I got ahead of myself. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Let's put this in perspective. Our lesson text. <clears throat> Should we love the world? Well, here's the answer. It's resolved biblically. 1 John 2 and verse 15, if you're with me, the Bible says, love not the world. And don't love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, <clears throat> the love of the Father is not in him. So what's the answer to the basic question on the floor tonight? Should we love the world? No. Oh, my brother Nelson, that's a little harsh. For all that is in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh the lust of, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, verse 17, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So having that backdrop where the Bible clearly states, do not love the world. The world is not the physical world, the earth. He's not saying, okay, hate the earth. 
go ahead and just go uh, dump some oil in the Gulf of Mexico. That's, that's not what the Bible is saying. Don't love the physical earth. The Bible is not saying don't love mankind. We've already covered those two. What the world is. So let's be, let's be clear tonight. What's the world the Bible? Don't love the world. The world of sin. The world of sin. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's run over there. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians, the second chapter, <clears throat> beginning at verse 1. Paul, writing to the church of Christ at Ephesus, has this to say. And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according, walk means live, you lived according to the course of this world, you lived in a sinful way, in other words, according to the prince of the power of the air, hmm. the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So who's the father of sin? And who's influencing the earth? And who is the prince of the power of the air? So when the Bible says, don't you fall in love with the world, not the earth, he's talking, he's not talking about the earth. He's not talking about don't love mankind. But the world of sin, but let's get even more specific, the domain of Satan. Satan wants nothing more than for you to just love this world, you and me. Love the world and just chill out and do whatever you need to do uh, in this world. First John chapter 5 and verse 19. So we, we can't talk heaven, hell, and judgment without putting it into some practical perspective on what we all have to deal with in our daily lives. Do not fall in love with this world. First John 5 and verse 19. So what may sound harsh is actually a matter of perspective. For anybody that's ever competed, or in any context, business, uh, athletics, you have to stay focused. You can't fall in love with the crowd because one, the one minute they're going to boo you, one minute they're going to cheer for you. And so it is with the world. So don't fall in love with this world. First John chapter 5 and verse 19, the Bible says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So the world we're talking about for clarity is the world, the realm, the domain of sin, the domain of Satan. And so we got to come out of this. And let's make, be more specific. When we say domain or realm, you're talking about a system. Uh, and we're not talking about people in particular. Satan's influence. Satan wants to yield his influence to cause people to hate. Babies don't come into this world hating. A newborn baby doesn't come to this world a sinner. We grow, we learn, we are conditioned, we are trained, we follow examples. So that what we're talking about tonight in the context of the world is that morally evil system, the realm, the domain of Satan, under his influence, opposed the enemy of righteousness versus unrighteousness. We, not, we don't wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical fight, it's spiritual. That which is opposed to God and Christ's kingdom. What is Christ's kingdom? His church. First John chapter four and verse number four. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So saints of God and visiting friends, please understand, do not love the world, but understand perspective. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We, re we come into contact with mankind. Yes, I mean, it was funny when I think about the earth and doing what's right, uh, you know, my son and I went fishing, and yeah, we caught some fish. That was, you know, it took me about 25 years to come home with, uh, you know, a little bit of confidence and bravado. Uh, I've caught fish before, but, you know, this time a little snapper and some jack. I said, Mama, we eating tonight. So that snapper and that jack was really good. And it feels good, a sense of satisfaction that God provided. Look at that beautiful ocean down in the Keys. And when that, when that pole bent and I pulled back and I felt something, it wasn't a rock. It wasn't seaweed this time. It was something that actually swam and was edible. So we thank God for this physical world, but we can't fall in love with it. Some people are uh, so, so, in, so much into the environment, environmentalists, that they don't have any regard for God. They're, so, they're concerned about a key deer in a tree. They need to be concerned about their soul because that tree is going to burn up at some point. 
and the animals, people, animal activists, and I'm not anyway, you know, I love animals. Animals are cute, but they ain't gonna save your soul. Perspective is what we're talking about tonight. So again, put the physical earth in its context. Mankind, we gotta deal with man, but understand that the world we're talking about is the realm of Satan, the influence of Satan. We're talking about sin. If someone is worldly, that means they're sinful versus being a child of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I hope you all understand that. That's the critical context tonight. So to answer the question, should we love the world? No. Do not love, love sin. Do not love the things in the world. Look at the bottom of your slide there. Do not love the things in the world under the influence of Satan. That's the message, the three-tier message tonight. We recognize the reality of sin and death and hell. Now we start dealing with the, what's in the world. Don't fall in love and don't get caught up with the influence of Satan. He's a deceiver. He's been a deceiver from the very beginning. He, Jesus says he's a father of lies. And he's been that way from the beginning. And he's dece So deception and trickery, deceit, really speaks to something that you may not see coming, but you got to be aware of it. So we talked about the beginning. And I want to, to cross-reference. I'll put it all on the screen for you for your convenience. I'll give you a break from turning your pages of your Bible. But in, in Wednesday night Bible class, you're going to turn your, turn your Bible. I want you to highlight it and write things down. From the beginning, we're going to cross-reference. This is called mating scriptures. And oftentimes you'll hear me and Rick and Brother Lindsay referring to this scripture and that scripture. It's called mating scriptures. Watch this side by side. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to make uh, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. We're talking about Eve, who obviously saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, make one wise. And Satan just lied to her. All he did was change one word, thou shalt not surely die. God said, the day you eat of the tree, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Satan said, you shall not surely die. That's called deception. Sometimes you can pervert God's word by adding a word or subtracting a word. We got to be mindful. Let's make, it, let's make this scripture. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let's cross-reference what's in red. Lust of the flesh, good for food. Lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes. A tree to make one wise, pride of life. So this was, in the very, nothing has changed. It's like music. You know, it's funny, I was listening to a song came on the radio and I said, that's an old school song, Lexi. She's like, no, Double Dutch Bus. That's a, a whatever the girl's name, former Cheetah Girl. I said, no, before there was a cheetah girl, that's old school music. Afros, bell bottoms, solid. We got to understand something. Uh, some of this stuff, it, there's nothing new. I have a brother wearing a fro today, that was around a long time ago. Same thing with music, same thing with cars. What am I saying to you, giving those practical examples? In the very beginning, when we think about Eve and sin and the influence of Satan, good for food, lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes, the lust, the desires of the eyes. A tree to make one wise, the pride of life. And so why do I share this with you? Because don't ever say, well, no, things are tougher than they've ever been. Sin has always been around. This, sometimes it might've been called something different, but it's still sin. And it was there in the very beginning. Genesis in the Hebrew means Bereshith. It's the book of beginnings. The book of begin the bare sheath is, you know, when you think about beginning and the beginning of family, the beginning of creation, but sin was right there. Let's take a look at each of these. The lust of the flesh. What are we talking about? The unbridled desires of the flesh. Lust by definition means uh, desire. So the lust of the flesh, we're in the flesh, we're in the world, and we can be influenced. Remember when we studied the fruit of the spirit? flesh versus spirit, that battle takes place every day. And if we're honest with ourselves, I, I've lost this battle sometimes. You've lost this battle sometimes. We give in to the flesh. We gotta be mindful. So uh, the lust of the flesh we're talking about, go to Galatians 5, 19 through 21 very quickly. 
we're speaking about the unbridled desires of the flesh. All that's in the world, the lust, the desires of the flesh. Because we have a few scriptures here, I want to, I'll go through them quickly. Time would not permit me to put everything on the screen for you, but y'all don't mind turning through your Bibles. Matter of fact, you need to turn through your Bibles. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. That word manifest comes up throughout the lesson tonight. Manifest means to reveal, to make plain. What are the, what are the works of the flesh? Let me read it again. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, that means to make plain. What are they? Adultery, sexual immorality, fornication, same thing. Sexual immorality within marriage, sexual immorality before marriage. Uncleanness, things that are just sinful. Lasciviousness, just nastiness. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. Just always at odds with somebody, contentious behavior. Emulations or jealousies, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying. So you basically talk about just, just lies. Lies, sexual immorality, uh, just being a brawler, being just ready to fight at any moment. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, just wild, boisterous parties and such like, Paul is saying. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. God don't like nasty. God does not like perversion. But our flesh desires these things don't the lust of the flesh. And in each of these categories, we need to put key things in control. Flesh versus spirit. Flesh versus spirit. Matthew chapter five and verse 28, uh, scripture that every single brother should have in long-term memory. Matthew five and 28, the brother's like, what scripture is that? Uh, you won't find out in a minute, brothers. Matthew chapter five and the verses 28. I've had so many brothers ask me about this scripture, <laughs> brother Rick, <laughs> but it's, it's very plain. Matthew five and verse 28. You got you to be mindful. You got to keep your heart. But I say unto you, Jesus speaking, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with his heart, with, with her already in his heart. Start sizing up a woman with your eyes and you lock in. It's not like you can never, it's not like, brother, you got to put on dark shades and never look at, never look at a woman. I mean, you, that, would be, that would be physically impossible. But we're talking about the desires of the heart. You, you see in Galatians chapter five, where the Bible clearly states, Paul says the works of the flesh are manifest. They're made plain, adultery, sexual immorality within the context of marriage, fornication that comes from the Greek word pornea, from which we get pornography. So be mindful of what you desire. It's a natural desire of the flesh for a man to be with a woman and a woman to be with a man, but it has to be kept under control. But if you look on a woman to lust after her, the Bible says, that who's looking at a woman to lust after her, you desire to have her within your thinking about, oh, what I would do with her. This is adult program tonight, kids. Jesus said, you've already committed adultery in your heart with her. I didn't touch her, well, but you thought about it. Keep your mind focused. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. Y'all all right tonight? I can't hear you, but just say all right. Romans 13, verse. everybody good? Amen, amen. Romans 13 and verse 14. We're talking about the lust of the flesh. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. As we think about uh, what, we are, what we are doing, amen. Somebody hit me up on the text. I got you, bro. Uh, <laughs> we we got to keep things under control. So look at what the Bible says. Don't make provisions for the flesh. Sometimes, folks, what does it mean to make provisions? See, oftentimes, if we're taking a trip, if I'm taking a family up to Disney or Orlando, I make provisions, put a little bit of money aside, fill up the car with gas, make sure the car is cleaned up, tell the kids to get a good night's sleep, pack their bags early so we can get on the road and head up to Orlando. Just use that as an example. That's making provisions. You prepare ahead of time. But what we do, if you want to be nasty, you wait for everybody to leave, you turn off the lights, you make sure ain't nobody around, you're making provisions for the flesh. And so when we think about relationships, Anybody in, in a relationship or serious about a relationship, make provisions for heaven. Put the time in. Get the biblical time in your heart so that you won't yield to the flesh because the flesh wants to always please itself. We got to keep this under control. So Paul, to the, to the Church of Christ at Rome, says, don't make provisions for the flesh. Quit creating the environment suitable for you to sin. Keep telling yourself that. Quit, you know, don't give place to the devil. Paul says that in the book of Ephesians. But when you make provisions for the flesh, please make sure 
that you that the 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 habitat the environment watch this the ecosystem as we call it in business is ripe for spiritual growth not sin that's the best way i can put it hope you all understood that first peter chapter 2 and verse number 11 first peter 2 and verse 11 we got to hasten on because we still got some others to deal with first peter 2 and verse number 11 we may go into overtime tonight you don't complain we'll be all right dearly beloved i beseech you i plead with you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul so paul said it jesus said it and now peter's saying now we're strangers and pilgrims strangers you know this is not our home pilgrim is just a sojourner we're just traveling through so if you take on that context that this world is not my home i'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue so paul peter says rather in first peter 2 verse 11 i beseech you i'm pleading with you to abstain stay away from fleshly lusts that war desires that war against the soul the battle is on <clears throat> don't feed the flesh feed the spirit but the word of god we got to hasten on class the lust of the flesh we dealt with didn't exhaust it but we want to put it in context all that's in the world the lust of the flesh those unbridled desires of the flesh the lust of the eyes unlawful longing for things we see unlawful longing you may see something and say man that's a nice house that's a nice car but be, that's not unlawful in and of itself you see something you desire it we're talking about things that are sinful ephesians 5 let's deal with verse 5 through 7 very quickly y'all turn with me now ephesians chapter 5 I want you to take my word for it. I want you to read it in your Bible. Write these scriptures down. Take a picture of the screen. Whatever you got to do to lock this thing in. Ephesians chapter 5, the lust of the eyes, beginning at verse number 5. For this we know, Paul says, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. <clears throat> Let no man deceive you with these vain words, with vain words, empty words. For because of these things, Come with the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be, be not ye therefore partakers with them. So don't, you know, covet, covetousness. You see something you long for. And it's something, you, again, be mindful uh, that we don't desire that when the Bible talks about a whoremonger, sexual immorality, don't, don't seek, don't, don't get caught up with that. Uh, nor unclean person, just talking about sinful desires, nor a covetous man, which is an idolater putting anything above God is idolatry. Some people covet, don't uh, you know, just fall in love with any, uh, does anything that you see, make sure it's good for you. Because all the, when you think about uh, Abraham and Lot, he saw the plain was well water. Everything that glitters is not gold. Let's keep that in mind. Let's go to Colossians 3 and verse five. Colossians chapter three and verse five. The lust of the eyes, uh, the lust of the eyes. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 5. Mortify, therefore, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. That means, you know, this unnatural affection, evil concupiscence. Concupiscence is translated as sexual desire, that illicit sexual desire. And so oftentimes, again, uh, when you think about pornography, when you think about that, what you see and you lock in on and all that, it's the lust of the eyes. Let me continue. Evil concupiscence, evil sexual desires. And covetousness, there it is again. You, someone else has you covet it and you want it. That can lead to jealousy. It can lead to envy. You need to be careful. For which things sake, verse six, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. But look at what Paul says. Verse seven, Colossians chapter three. In the which ye also walked sometime when you lived in them. So we're not new to this. We're not new to this. We, reckon, we know what a desire of the flesh feels like. We know what the lust of the eyes feels like. And we need to keep this under control. Put these scriptures down and put them in your long-term memory. The 119th division of the book of Psalms. Psalms 119th division. And we'll look at verse 36. Psalms 119 and verse number 36. The Bible states, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. May I not see something and covet after it. May I not long for what I don't have. 
That's really the basic definition of covetousness, longing for what you don't have. See, contentment and covetousness don't co cannot coexist. Be content with the things that you have, whereas covetousness is about what you don't have. Sometimes people can get a job and get their first paycheck, and instead of being thankful, well, I need it. He make more money than me. Be thankful. You were unemployed a week ago. So put it in context. So incline my heart unto your testimonies, God, and not to covetousness. Verse 37, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Vanity is that which is empty, that which is here today and may be gone tomorrow. And quicken thou me in thy way. So the prayer of the psalmist is, Lord, help me focus my mind, my heart on those things that are good for me. Lord, help me grow up. Lord, help me stay focused on what you would have me to be. Because if I yield to my eyes, I will do some, I will sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. When we think about the lust of the eyes, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We begin reading it about verse number 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. I can literally just give you these scriptures, but I want to walk you through with this. Uh, and I hope you all appreciate that. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we begin reading it about verse number 6. Here we go. But godliness with contentment is great gain. As I said, contentment and covetousness cannot coexist. You need to make a decision. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. <laughs> Having food and raiment, let us there with, let us be there with content. There it is again. You're going to either covet or you're going to be content. Be thankful for what you have. But if you have the wandering eyes, you always want something more. You always want something better. Nothing wrong with goal setting. I'm not knocking that. But keep your, keep your focus spiritually. But they that be rich, the, they that will be rich, fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Perdition means destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money in and of itself. The love of money is the root of all evil. Here it is. Which while some coveted after, it's never enough. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Now the pride of life. From the beginning, we saw it, Genesis 3 and 6, cross-reference in John, 1 John 2, verse 16. But the pride of life, don't get full of yourself. Nothing wrong with being confident. I can, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It's not about you. It's not about me. I'm thankful to God for the ability, the opportunity that God has given me. And you be thankful to God for what he's given you. But make sure you understand where it comes from. On, you know, whether it's youth. Some people boast in their youth. You know, some young people, I ain't got to worry about that. Go ahead, old man. You better go somewhere that old, that old fogey Bible, old man. Don't you know, I'm, I'm 21. I'm 18. I'm 16 years old. I got it all together. Don't, be, don't boast about your age because tomorrow's not promised. Don't boast about your wealth or uh, what you may have uh, economically. There's, there's industries that have been crushed by this global pandemic. Folks who maybe a month or so ago not long ago, didn't have to worry about things that are now unemployed. Keep it in context. Be thankful. And when you, when you gain something, if you have an accomplishment, uh, any type of, you know, thank God. Just get used to saying that. Thank God. So Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 16, you remember the man that God called a fool. Let's go to Luke 12 very quickly. Luke chapter 12. And some of these I may have to paraphrase as we move on. Uh, but Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse number 12. Luke, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 16, excuse me. Jesus spake a certain parable unto them. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He was doing well, in other words. And he thought within himself, be careful when you start talking to yourself, saying, I'm a bad man. You better be careful with all that. Uh, we got to remind ourselves, thank God for this opportunity. He thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruits. No thank God anywhere. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns. No thank, no thank God in there and build greater. I want to build even bigger barns. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. I and my, not thank you, Lord, not my Lord. This is I and my, be careful. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. 
take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Sit back and enjoy. Look at what I did. Look at me. But God, there it is, but God, verse 20, said unto him, thou fool. Now, when God calls you a fool, you are show sure enough fool. You know what show sure enough means. I see you after class. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You made provision for the flesh. You didn't make provision for me. So you fool, you're gone tonight. And guess who's going to take? It's going to be somebody else's stuff. They don't even have to work for it. So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So as we think about the pride of life, don't get caught up in yourself, in your accomplishments, and in including age or power or might. Don't get caught up with that. Keep it under control. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17. Very quickly. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17. As we think about what God has done for us tonight, what he's done for us throughout uh, our lives, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, charge them that are rich in this world, that they may not be high-minded, high-minded, pride of life, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Trust in God. It's funny that the money, the currency we use in this country says in God we trust. A lot of people trust in that money and they trust in themselves. Philippians 2 and verse 3. Come on. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3. It's on your screen there. The verse is rather. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. I got to hasten on. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. High-minded, pride of life. Vain glory, pride of life. Don't you do things uh, that's like being haughty and high-minded but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now you have a better context, hopefully, of those three and what they are. Don't fall in love with any of this stuff, because it will cost us our soul. So do not love the world, in case you missed it. Don't love immorality. Don't love materialism. There's nothing wrong with having a job buying a car, buying a house, taking, doing nice things for your family. Nothing wrong with that. Don't fall in love with it. Do not fall in love with it. And your accomplishments, great. You graduated. You're moving on. You got your college degree. You got all of this. You got a job. But thank God, don't forsake the Lord's church because of a job. Don't love the world. Amen, saints. Let's close it out. So you can't love the world and the Father. You got to make a decision. We got to hate some. No man can serve two masters. Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 24, you're going to love the one or hate the other. You're going to hold to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and this world. I got to quote some of these for time's sake. That's Matthew 6 and verse 24. You cannot love, serve two masters. Make a decision. Loving the world makes you an enemy of God. James chapter 4 and verse 4. Some of these I need to read to you. James chapter 4. In verse number four, because I want you to hear what James has to say as it relates to how we live our lives. The word is enmity, which means hostility. James chapter four in the verses four. Some of these I'll read to just uh, reinforce a point. James talking to brothers and sisters in Christ says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. In other words, he's using like sexual immorality as the backdrop. But what he's talking about is you are, you, you're, you're like a spiritual whore. You love God, but yet you're cheating on him. Y'all catch that? Ye adulterers and adulteresses. That's what he's saying. Know ye not that friendship, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? You can't fall in love with materialism. Don't fall in love with uh, sin. Don't fall in love with your own accomplishments. Just say, thank you, God. Praise God. But I'm James dealing with a situation where people began to fall in love with the world and their own accomplishments. So James is saying to them, you're, you're whoring. You're like a spiritual whore. Friendship with the world is enmity, hostility, by trans translation, hostility with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, a friend of sin. You no, know, Jesus uh, dined with sinners. He didn't make him a friend of sin. He was seeking to influence them. Let's make sure we get that right. Otherwise, if you listen to this, some say, I'll never leave my house. That's not what the Bible's teaching. You're going to be around sinners. Don't fall in love with sin. Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. God knows you don't want to be an enemy of God. 
do not love the world. Why? Because the world is passing away. One, you can't love the world and the Father. Love God, and while we live in this world, be an influence for good. Amen. The world is passing away. Second Peter 3 and 10, the earth will melt with fervent heat. This world is not our home. So the, phys the physical earth will be no more at some point when God says so. Don't ask me in the chat. Well, when will the world come to an end so I can get right? Well, that would be, he's going to come as a thief in the night. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. But God knows. So the world and everything in it will be burnt up. That's not to scare you. It's to keep it in perspective and give us context. We too are passing away. First Peter chapter one and verse 24, Peter talks about the earth and, the, and the, we're like the grass of the field that are faded away. James chapter four and verse 14, I got a quote and paraphrase for time's sake. James says, what is your life? It is even a vapor, a mist that appeared for a little while and then vanishes away. So the world is, and everything in it will be, will melt with the fervent heat, second Peter three and 10. Our life is just a mist a vapor that appeared for a little while. We're like the flower of the field and the grass. The grass withered, the flower thereof faded away. So we, we know that our time, Hebrews 9, 27, we, want, we're, we have an expiration date. I don't know when, you don't know when, but we know it will come. So why don't we love the world? Because we can't love the world and the Father. Why don't we love the world? Because it's gonna pass away. This whole realm where Satan has influence will pass away. But those who do God's will, here we go, those who do God's will will abide forever. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew the seventh chapter and verse 21. As we think about what God has said to us tonight, and as we, as we close out this lesson in the next few minutes, Jesus says himself, not everyone that saith unto me, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. We must do God's will. And when we do God's will, we already read it in the beginning, Revelation 14 and verse 13. And lo, I heard a voice right saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, yea, saith the Spirit, from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they, those who die in the Lord, may rest from their labors, their work, and their works do follow them. Don't fall in love with this world. And if you think that maybe there's a prophet if I fall in love with this world, Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 26, Matthew 16 and verse 26, verse 26 what good is it <laughs> if you shall gain the whole world, gain the whole world and lose your very soul? What doth it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose? his very soul. And so tonight, I hope, trust, and pray that you are clear that that word manifestation, I was talking to my son about it this morning, that word manifest means to make plain, to reveal. And when you think about words, words have meaning. Messaging matters. God's manifestation. How did God make plain his love for the world, his love for mankind, his love for the souls of men. God doesn't love sin, but God, John 3 and verse 16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, he loved mankind, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus Christ, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, mankind, through him, through Jesus Christ, might be saved. The earth, save all the trees you want. You can plant whatever you, I mean, take care of it. It's a basic natural resource. Throw back the small fish, keep the big ones so they can hit the circle of life. Yeah, so God gave us dominion so we can eat. But at the end of the day, it's not, not about that snapper. It's going to be about your soul. It's not about that tree or this extinct uh, species of animal. It's about your soul and mine. So God revealed, he manifested, he made plain his love for the world, his love for mankind by the giving of his dear son. And his son, Jesus Christ, is the epitome, the medium through which all mankind can be saved. We must hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It's a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must hear and believe that with all your heart. Acts 15 and 7. You must hear and believe that Jesus died. He was buried and he rose again the third day. You must be willing to change your mind, your heart, 
saying, I, I see this world's not my home. Exactly. Let me get ready. Let me turn from my ways and turn to God. Luke 13, three and five. Confess Christ to be the son of the living God. Go down in the water grave of baptism. Wash and be clean. Your sins are washed away in baptism. You're added to the body of the church of Christ. And be faithful, living, not loving the world until death. Because God has promised all that will live faithful in Christ Jesus a crown of life. That concludes our lesson tonight. Should we love the world? Absolutely not. Brother Rick, uh, let's see. Uh, I hope you're doing well tonight, brother. Let's, uh, if there's any questions in the chat, we're happy to answer them. Uh, let me see how I do on time. 7.50, not too bad. If there's any questions or comments, we'd be happy to uh, take that. Let's engineers unmute my big brother uh, and let's see if we can talk a little bit. Great, great foundational lesson, Doc. They're always good. It cuts right to the soul. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Any comments or questions as it relates to the lesson tonight, Brother Rick? Nothing in the chat yet. I'm sure they're typing now. Okay, they should have been typing earlier now. You know, we ain't got all night. Y'all need to put that stuff in there early. As it hits you, go ahead and put it in the chat. Engineers, make sure that chat is open. Uh, we, want, we want to make sure everything's good. All right, I see some things popping up now. My dear sister Ella said, good lesson. And it was, it was very plain, Doc, very clear. Thank you, Brother. Brother Aldridge, amen for a dynamite lesson. Yeah, thank you, brother. We have another one. I am saddened by our leaders in action to protect people from the health impact of COVID-19 because of the love of money. But, but is has said to me that I am being focused too much on the things of the world. Uh, how can not be concerned about the devastation this has had on us? Well, we recognize that. Uh, and uh, as I, as I hear, uh, the comment and maybe the question, how can we not be concerned about the devastation? That's the gist to, of it. Right. And I think at the end of the day, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we should absolutely, uh, no one likes to see people suffer, but the Bible didn't say that we would not, uh, we, 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 we won't die. We don't know how we will die. I mean, some people die tragically. We're sitting here and I think the, the queer, the queerest is exactly right. Uh, man is focused on making money the love of money. So if some people, have, I even heard a guy in an interview say, well, if some people have to die, then at least if grandmama got to die, well, y'all just give her a kiss and thank grandmama for what all she's done because the economy has to keep on going. I mean, you, hard, that's hard. blatant, blatant love of money. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I think how can we not be concerned with, we should be concerned with people and mankind, but the greatest concern, we're not gonna prevent anybody from dying. We gotta be safe. If you don't die from COVID, you're going to die from something else. Uh, and so, but the main concern is the, the soul of mankind. That's all. Amen. That's our focus, Brother Rick. If I miss something there, let me know. No, you hit it. We have some, we have a few more. We have a thank you for this lesson. Being newly divorced, there are plenty of temptations out there. Trying to stay busy and focused on the word, capital W. No, we appreciate that. And let me just, and so that, tra that kind of transparency. And one of the things, Rick, I must say, to our saints that have always, uh, in this chat, uh, people are writing things for everyone to see and know. That, that takes courage. Yes, it uh, does. And uh, don't, and again, so back to the comment there, when you think about uh, you know, someone saying, okay, I'm, I'm recently divorced and a lot of temptations, don't you let allow your anger uh, to then turn into uh, just some hookup. I'm gonna go ahead and say it uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so because of, you know, anger and hurt and pain, the flesh, the body still has need. We got to keep our minds focused. So thank you for being transparent. Thank you for being honest. But I'll keep your focus on God, brother, sister, whoever that may be. Amen, Doc. Here's another one. Great lesson. John 3 and 6. Could you explain, define the second spirit with the Lord case S and spirit capital, capital uh, S? Spirit is spirit. Well, let me just look at it, Rick. We start getting a lowercase and capital. I want to make sure that we under John 3 and verse number 6. Okay, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we got, you know, Jesus is talking about, you know, the natural man and the spiritual man. Uh, we, we recognize when, we're, when we are born into this world, uh, the God gives us the breath into the nostrils of men, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we have the spirit of life. So we know hu the human being, we have to be born again. So we, the spirit of life, keep in mind, the spirit of life and a new life in Christ 
uh, we, we take on the Holy Spirit once we have obeyed the gospel. So the small s always speaks about we have a new life. And so in John 3 and 6, let me look at it in context here very clearly. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. He's talking about just being born into this world. And that which is born of the Holy Spirit is alive. So we are yet alive human beings when we receive the capital S Holy Spirit, because once you're dead, the spirit of life goes back, small s, goes back to God, Ecclesiastes 12 and 7, who gave it. You cannot get the Holy Spirit after you are dead. So what Jesus is saying is, while you are yet alive, you must be born again, because flesh begot flesh. You're born into this world, and while you have the blood running warm in your veins, small s, spirit of life, you better obey the gospel and get the capital S, the Holy Spirit. Man, that should be a lesson right there, brother. Absolutely. The, the whole world gets the lowercase s. Yes, sir. Only Christians get the capital S. That's all right. That sounds like a Tony Little question. Was that Tony Little? I, I, man, I can't believe you said that. That's exactly who it came from. Yes, but little, little bro. Go ahead, little bro. I hope that was helpful for you, brother. Uh, we have Keep My Family in Prayers from the COVID. Amen. And, and uh, we have, I really appreciate this lesson. I'm better understanding what it means to not love the world. Thanks again. Yeah, we, we're in the world but we're not of the world and we can't get caught up in the things that are in this world. And hopefully we made that clear throughout the lesson. The most important thing is we want to just, we need each other and brothers and sisters, let me say this. Are there any other questions, Rick, before I, I close out with a comment? Just the last comment was amen by brother Aldridge. Well, you know, he got to get the last word. <laughs> he laughing right now. Uh, but I guess the point I would make Rick in closing is we need each other. We need to yes. be able to tell each other that, Hey, I'm struggling. Uh, that's why some of the comments that were made tonight, I'm struggling, brothers and sisters. I'm struggling with my anger. I'm struggling with sexual immorality, with temptation. Whatever it is, you cannot get through this alone. That's so right. God loves us, and we're thankful to God to have the opportunity to teach tonight. Amen. Anything else, Rick, in the chat? I don't want to overlook anybody. No, that was the last one. Okay. Well, thank you all for your comments or questions. Um, Brother Lindsay, uh, let's unmute Brother Lindsay. Your engineers, please. Brother Lindsay there? I saw him on the screen. Okay, they'll find him. Okay, I got it. Brother Lindsay, Hello, how you brothers. doing, brother? Hey, that was a great lesson followed by a great discussion. Man, Thank really you. great lesson. Thank you, brother. Really timely. Appreciate you, brothers. We appreciate you, appreciate Lindsay. you, Lindsay. Any announcements yep. for the congregation, Lindsay? No, I don't have anything right now. Thank you. Okay, brother. Brother Rick, any announcements? Just seven quick words. Stay in the Bible and be safe. Hey Amen. That's too, That's a good word. Uh, just a couple additional announcements. Uh, and Brother Rick Lindsay, I'll, send, I'll text this to you all as well. On July 18th, uh, our, uh, our deacon over to youth, Brother David James, assisted by his help me, uh, Sister Lisa James, have scheduled uh, July 18th at 4 p.m. to all young people, all youth, uh, a fireside chat with the elders. That's July 18th at 4 o'clock, a fireside chat uh, with the elders. We'll have that on the announcements for Sunday as well. But please mark your calendars. We'll send uh, the necessary Zoom link. And as you all recognize tonight, from now on, all Miami Gardens Church of Christ uh, meetings will have, will have a, a, a password required. That's a Zoom requirement starting on the 19th. MGCC, all caps. MGCC, all caps. So July 18th, 4 p.m., Fireside chat with the elders uh, for the youth. Uh, thank David and Lisa James for their diligence 